Welcome you, uh, all of you, to another uh, event of the Connexon Field Continuous, a partnership between the Instituto de Computação of the University of Campinas and the Department of Informática da Forquilla. Uh, during uh, the last two years, um, the Connexon has uh, invited, invited many uh, re uh, renowned uh, scientists, artists, book authors, and uh, 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 thinkers and ask them to share their knowledge and experience about the future of computer and uh, data science and AI. And today I'm very glad to uh, in, in introduce uh, in Professor uh, Claudio Misenes uh, de Farias. He, he graduated uh, in computer science in uh, uh, and got his master's and PhD in computer science from uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, in uh, 2014. And he has, uh, was chosen by the NCTI to represent Brazil in the BRICS Young uh, Scientists uh, Forum in the area of uh, cyber physical. Uh, Systems in 2031, and was awarded the, the scholarship for uh, Jovem Uh Currently, Misery works in at the uh, the graduate program in systems engineering and computing, the best uh, copy at my In 2022. He, uh, the professor won the IEEE uh, High Intelligent Work Group Middle Career Researcher Award for contributions in the field. Uh, his main uh, topics of interest are smart cities, Internet of Things, data fusion, and security. So I, I, I welcome uh, Claudio and uh, I ask you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ambler. It's a pleasure to be here. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for your attention. It's Friday, I understand it's a challenge. And one of the things I would like to start is like middle career, it kind of hurts me a bit. Not at all, come on, middle, I mean, not 10 years. I don't have a 10 year PhD, but it's okay. It's a war and I like it, but middle career, it's kind of a word. So what do I do? Uh, as Professor in the Senate, I came from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I did uh, almost everything there. I, I actually also worked for the Pedro Segundo School. It's a very traditional school in here. It was very rewarding in many ways. And I'm from many places. I am a wanderer. I came from Pesky. My main uh, graduate work came from Pesky, but I also came from the Instituto Teso Pasic, de Pesquisas e Aplicações Computacionais, NCE at UFRJ, More Applied Computing. And I was, uh, up to last week, I was in the Dean of Graduate Studies at the university, but I'm not there anymore. So less administrative work, it's great. So I can focus with you on what I do. I build machine learning systems for Industry 5.0. So, come on. Yes. So uh, the main focus of what I do since my PhD was the Internet of Things. I never started as uh, intentionally in the IoT field. My during my uh, undergrad, I did like VoIP, voice over IP stuff. Then I decided voice is okay, signaling great. We can do better. Then I went to video, and during my masters, I was working with video quality, and then. Everything changed and I went to a computer, a more computer network topic in IoT. Uh, those who've been doing this for the last 10 years know that IoT is quite recent. We, we used to do wireless sensor networks. So it's uh, actually my thesis was on a topic called shared sensor networks, how to share application data. 
And in the first trends on IoT, we use a term just the sensors and the sync node to the outside network. And that was it. We found that very interesting concepts, just two layers, and things start to get complicated because it's in the 2012, 2013, it appeared like clouds. And people started talking about clouds and clouds were great. And they said, damn. And then it, in the 2015 started to appear things like edge. And when it, I first saw a paper about edge, I said, no, I have a name for edge, we call it sync nodes. And they said, no, 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 it's different. And people started calling about edge AI. And I said, come on, come on, let's get, get a break. So it's a, the idea is quite simple. Like I have, if I go up, I have more processing power. If I go down, my decision delay is smaller, and that's all. So the game now is to decide where to get, uh, get a decision. So my requirements, my application requirements start to get very interesting because if I have like a sensor, uh, a hard sensor, I don't want to get a decision delay unless I don't like the guy. So, joking, joking, <laughs> it's being recorded. So it's a... Uh, Unless I don't like the guy to say, I, 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 I don't want to get, have a decision delay. But I don't, not only I don't want to have a decision delay, I don't want to get it wrong. So either I have one single decision or I have three levels of decision. I have a decision closer to, my, to the event or I will have just a decision at a cloud network. What are the requirements of my applications? And if I'm talking about uh, Internet of Things, those of us who started uh, uh, like 10, 15 years ago, we have like a single network or a single application. This doesn't seem too much as the Internet, does it? <laughs> this doesn't seem like what we wanted to do. So, but our devices were resource constrained. They still are, but not as much. Adriano's here, he, he shared this part with me with talking about Mika's. Mika's have like 4K of RAM, yeah. 4K bytes of RAM. So it's uh, challenging. And now we will have exciting one megabyte RAM to play. So it's uh, we can do multiple applications. So this is the thing. And you start to see things like Raspberry Pi and other stuff going on. So this changed a bit. And in 2013, it started a movement in Germany. Germany. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about what, what a fourth industrial revolution at first it was a group of interesting saying like we can uh, measure and sense everything in the part of my uh, building part or my manufacturing part and through this sensing data I can use AI big data and sensors to understand my path and reduce the costs but as it has evolved in 2016 we saw one of uh, a philosopher saying that's like industry 5.0 is to use everything in society as a manufacturing process. If you want like to have a book, you have to have paper, you have to have trees, you yeah. have to have uh, oil. So everything in this uh, process of society, uh, of society is actually a manufacturing process. And if you start to think like this, how can I reduce the cost of everything? Instead of mass production, how can I have an individualized way to produce goods? With the same price, but without uh, destroying an entire mine to get everything or cut down a forest, if you could get one single tree, you can predict it. So the, 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 this idea was leveraged not only by sensors, but actually for AI, for big data, security, of course, robotics, there is my little trainer. So it's, uh, um, of course, when you, when you start to see that as it evolves, society has to evolve around it. So there are discussions about how we will empower this, how we will power by renewable goods, okay? But is it enough? Can I, or I will have to use a nuclear power plant or something like it. I use wires or wireless will be the, the case. So there's discussion. And as the discussion evolved, we see to emerge the concept of what we call nowadays Industry 5.0. So if we take it in, it in consideration like the, the five steps. So the fourth step that I was talking in this part of is what we call cyber physical systems. Where everything that you have learned in college nowadays in graduate studies, 
means to be used. So I have mechanization, mass production, and I have automation. And some scholars say that in Brazil, we didn't get like the third level up to now. So, and this is a challenge and challenge means opportunities. If you don't have this third level of computer and automation properly, it means how can we go from the second to the fourth or the second to the fifth? The fifth uh, 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 industrial uh, level means mass customization and cyber physical cognitive system. So the word is kind of what does that mean? So it's like buzzword for more papers published mm -hmm. for industry four, industry five, industry five plus plus, mm -hmm. LTE. Oh, sorry, I can't speak like this. So it's uh, actually what it means like ethical concerns inside of your AI models. So those concerns that I have about an ethical or uh, of individualized perception of society, how does it feel? when I play it uh, on a sensor. Uh, for instance, like if you imagine uh, this mass production for in my case that I'm around 40s, I feel like this. So it's uh, my perception of reality affects the path of production of the things that I will consume. So how does this impact in the society around me? Because if I, I don't know, if I have a lot of money, not the case in the professor, we don't have lots of money, but uh, um, for, you can change. I always say if one of my students become a billionaire, every 1% it's enough. Just a suggestion you at, at home watching us from YouTube and just saying, but uh, how can I affect this production? If I have resources, will I consume more from the machine that, that will drag my society? How can I do this in, in the fair way? So we are trying, how do I know that the, the applications and the models that you drive this technology are fair or safe or reliable in any way? So we say things about like explainable AI paradigms or reliable AI paradigms, how do I do? I don't know how this works nowadays in big machines. How do I do this in a fair way? In a, in a sensor. That, that's my game, that's what I do. And if you take it, you can say, why? Why use someone waste his life doing like things like this? Because if you believe things like COVID, COVID had a problem, not only in Brazil, but all around the globe about like ventilation machines. And if you could share those machines, if you could like use AI to prevent infections, prevent uh, scheduling devices, knowing, how our industry can turn in a, in a faster way, maybe we would have saved a lot of people. And unfortunately, that was not the case. So my concern is to do everything that we were doing and in industry not 5.0 uh, in a human-centric, resilient, and sustainable way. In other words, I will, I will just get in industry 4.0 and make it harder to, 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 to program. It's fine. So this will lead to what we call a digital transformation. Uh, so it's a summarize of several uh, broader perspectives, not only on technology, but our, our society, of how we communicate, how we exchange data, how can we automate. So when you say about 5G, we're not saying about 5G, oh, it's faster. Of course it's faster. It has been faster since the 80s. What you are saying is if everything you do relies on a cell phone, <clears throat> Your cell phone is you in a digital way. Is it your digital twin of some sorts? Uh, and I say this because if you think about it, about it for a single second, and you see, if you get a car and you don't know how to drive, you have an app, you call it an Uber. But Uber has sensors. It has to have a GPS position, has to have a, a battery sensor to know it's not dragging you around. And if you don't want to pay, you don't have to have a card of cash. You know cash though. The paper stuff, no? the generation don't know anymore. <laughs> like uh, you can pay by your cell phone. This is crazy stuff, crazy stuff. And uh, coins, those little bright things. And if you are talking about seeing a course like this, you can be watching this uh, this lecture right now from your cell phone using 4G. 
in a car in the middle of red line, yellow line. I don't know, traffic is complicated. And all those things can gather. And in some weird cases, if you, nowadays it is possible, if you want to have a good from like Amazon, a drone can bring to you using your cell phone and GPS data. And this is level, lead us to a really different world and all cognitive senses from our grandparents. Our parents may understand some of it. My generation is the first generation that gets both sides. But my students, they were born with internet and each time faster. So this, is, this digital transformation is not fundamentally just a technological transformation. This is a society, societal level transformation. And we have to build stuff for that. And I did computer science and I did computer science because I wanted to build stuff. And I remember I was, I was getting like an XP class, extreme programming. For those that are a little bit older, is baby scrum, like stuff like this. Uh, scrum in your early days. And uh, my professor uh, was actually uh, asking, why do you build software? I said, because it's cool. And he said, mm, no, you build software because it makes money. So, but yeah, kind of nerdy, I know. So my focus was on how to build stuff. I'm a builder. I like to build stuff, to build solutions, to build like, applications. And when you go to IoT, and most of you were in the lab, were seeing like, you know, like building stuff for IoT is not by React stuff, Next stuff, which is cool though. You should do a lot of web stuff, it's, it's, it's great, but there is a lot of different stuff to take care of. So what do we need to develop those applications for industry four and consequently to industry five? We need new architectures. We need to develop a software level architectures that are context aware. If you take like uh, an old lady or your grandparents, for instance, man, I, I know like I have this figure on my classes that I call the average grandparent. Now, it's a fictional grandparent that has lots of health issues and does not, not know to use computers. So it's may or may not have similarities to reality in any sorts. But it's interesting to have like this on, on your class to understand like people have different problems. So sometimes in my case, uh, uh, I may have knee problems or someone may have like heart diseases or lung disease or diabetes. How can I ensure their safety and quality of life? Or someone that has a, a weird schedule like those guys that keep grading to two o'clock in the morning. It can happen to some people. How those things are related to their health. How can I say, no, no, I have to drink water. Or I have to say, you have to eat. <laughs> or you have to say, now it's time to stop. Or I have to take medicine. How do I can build apps that are fit for a single purpose, for a single person, and can exchange information between apps. It's a very interesting case from my PhD that Let's think about it. Imagine that you have an air conditioning system. Great. And imagine that one of your colleagues has sociopathical features and he brings, uh, there's no paper in here, a uh, piece of paper and puts fire on this piece of paper. Fire is a very interesting uh, thing, not because I like fire, but for the theoretical approach. When a fire starts, you don't see a lot of CO2 at first, but you see increases in temperature that go exponentially. But imagine that you have an air conditioning system. They are not talking. It's temperature increases, air conditioning decreases. Temperature increases, as you, at the moment you start to measure CO2 is already too late. So you see applications can have synergy in a, of sorts and mask themselves. So this application has to consider that what we get about sensors is information and how we transform this information is the most important part. How we create knowledge about the environment and how to manage it. And I will tell you a brief story because I have to look uh, already. So it's uh, imagine fiction, uh, in a fictional way that you have a shopping mall 
let's call shopping B. That's is in a fictional fictional city called R. And there is a shopping mall called B in a neighborhood called B. Uh, everything fictional. They has bought a fire detection system from Sweden. And in Sweden, there is a Hey guys, we have some small problems, but now we're back. So you miss me? Hope so. Otherwise, well, not a lot of you have run, so it's I think it's okay. And in the shopping mall B and the neighborhood B in the fictional city R, there they bought like a system, a fire detection system from Sweden, which the main condition is anything above 50 degrees Celsius is a fire. In a given day, the air conditioning stop was working during summer. In this fictional city R, in this neighborhood B, it's 53 degrees in summer. It's all concrete. What do you fictionally think it happened? Sprinklers. What's up? If you search on Google, since it's a fictional story, you have never seen something like it. And so it's an all fiction, you never know. So how, uh, and the question that I do is from all your soft engineering, blah, 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 and that you learn from there, here and there, the software was wrong. You need to do something that is what was not supposed to do. It was correct. The, the guy coded it. It worked, it passed the test. It was deployed. So, but the conditions are unique. So any software that you do that requires to get information from a given environment has to deal with unique environmental uh, conditions, has to deal with things and features that are meant on to here. If uh, I, I have this student that is going to France and he has some uh, 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 allergies in here and he went to these allergies and the allergist said to him, you're going to France in the, yes, in the course. Great, you have, have no problem about allergies. It's like, okay, you see that his software is different. And how now in this environment we're exchanging information for cars, your cell phones, your smart watches, your hard devices, and any kind of sense, how do I trust those transactions? And since this is software and that use a AI, that uses IoT, how can I ensure that those things work properly? How can I have an ML ops operation or IoT, IoT ops? And how can I do decide that since I want those things to be secure and private, I want to have privacy over my head, I can decide stuff on my own. So I've talked a lot about federated learning. So we developed this architecture, this beautiful spider stuff in here. It's an architecture that has been, been published a lot in the last few years. Then I take some things that are obvious, like if you want to sense data, you have to have a sensing component. And this sensing component has to use or at least to adapt to the environment itself. I have to have something to schedule my data. If I have different applications and I have operational sensors in slide, pre RTOS or Zephyr OS or anything, I have to schedule those applications that have been sharing on my network. I have to be able to decide about stuff. At a local level, my sensor got a data, I'll have to use a filter or something like it, or giving a lot of things in part of the sense. I'm not talking about neural networks yet, you see the next slide, something about it, but I want to take decisions on a local level at a global level. But to, to have this even at a global level, I have to be able to route, and to, to be able to route, I have to do secure applications. And I have to actuate on the environment. So my sensor has to have a lot of things. And we've been doing this for a long, long time. I have to cut people. I love you, but I don't have to see you now because I have to see the slides. And we have been discussing this in the last few years using like trusted transactions, using things like subjective logic. We have been dealing with predictability, you like in environments such as housing or in the vehicular monitoring stuff. We've been doing like 
we've generated decisions and distributed decisions <laughs> or context-aware domain models. We have published last week in Fusion 2023 about how you build the software based on your sensing decisions. How can you exchange the models given what the data you collect, how to build dynamic, dynamically software for those devices. So these are this application integration, this modeling it has something that we have been doing for the last few years. And but actually one of the things that I've never dominated in my life is PowerPoint. So I have to do another PhD for that. I should have done this in LaTeX. I'm just too lazy. So sensors. And when I started traditional sensors on sense data. And nowadays you see things like edge impulse and all of, all of the stuff or Newton AI or all this. They imagine that you have a sensor that gets data and sent to the cloud. It's okay for some cases. It's okay for your Google Home or your Alexa. It's not that good if you have like, like, like I said, something for health or something if you are in like in Petrobras or in other or uh, body and you are in a middle of an appropriation or if you are in the army, you have to take online decisions. So, but if you work with sensors, why the sensor on IoT, you know that sending data is expensive when you have batteries. So what we do, we try to compress to use data fusion and this sense Almost everything of the data, not literally 99%, but you know what I mean, is discarded due to sensor restriction. We don't have memory. Even that you now we have megabytes of bandwidth. To store things is messy at, at best. So what we're trying to, try to do is to have all device intelligence. We've been doing this with data fusion for the last 10 years. And nowadays we've been trying to do this with AI, but it's, Complicated is not easy because what you're trying to do instead of discarding data, trying to change what data means. Because if you take into consideration, like a sensing a sensor, what a sensing sensor collects? Come on, that. Give a shoot. What, what is collected by a sensing uh, temperature sensor? It's not temperature. It's giving a hint. It's a signal. It's a sign that you try to change in some way, and, and you interpret it as data. So everything that you collect is either a transformation of a physical environment. That's why I firmly believe that all composite process should have a little bit of physics for you to understand what we gather signals and signals of and not only an interpretation of the world around us. And this led me to the downside. Since we're getting data on now the train of everything you place on an AI model, not even an AI model, machine learning, because we are using AI in a very degraded way. Like uh, everything is AI and nothing is AI. So it's uh, what are the downsides of AI? Usually centralized because you're saying AI and talking about uh, Amazon stuff, GCP stuff. And psychic learn stuff, and not for sensors. Hang on. Lots of power required for data transmission, lots of processing power required. You're talking about like blockchain level stuff. Like, if you take uh, blockchain, I, I, I saw the other day that blockchain farms around the world cost more energy than that Denmark. And my sensor was based on like to batteries, AA batteries, and have to last. So not suits for Samsung, right? It's not that easy because it, this guy, Pete Varden, and a lot of guys before him, they know uh, this, what we call embedded machine learning, or TinyNL. TinyNL is a nice name for embedded machine learning, how to bring machine learning to sensors. And usually when people talk about machine learning, they are not talking actually about machine learning. They talk about neural networks. And of course, they love neural network. It's kind of, kind of cool. But come on, you see the Norway book. It's a little bit more than neural networks. And, but what's this interesting stuff? This is uh, Arduino 
uh, nano 33 BLE sensed what means the best name for a sensor ever. And that has a Cortex M4 processor. It's a processor dedicated for AI. It's fun, it's crazy, and it's crazy cheap. I think it's $18. And if you buy the box, it's dirty. It's so beautiful. And this is an SAI. And the SI, S32i has a camera built for you to do computer vision side of sensors. So, but come on, <coughs> machine learning has some steps. You have to collect data, you have to train data, and you have to classify stuff. <coughs> train data inside of a sensor. Or collect all the data you train inside of a sensor with 4K on hand. Mm, doesn't seem suitable, huh? So what we are trying to do, it's like all these big firms that have been talking about TensorFlow and Google. I said about <laughs> Army, I said about MicroTensor, TimeMachine.org is an organization, amazing videos on YouTube. And you talk about STM or Qualcomm, a lot of those guys work on those things. And the first approach was easy. You don't do the training side of the sensor. You train in the GCP, and then you throw the classifier inside of the sensor and it, it, you clutches the sensor, but then you start to see like, my model is static. Things change. They are supposed to change. And everyone who has worked with IoT knows like, worse than communicating, it's updating. How do you update a sensor image? Or even applications, if you have like an operational system, you may have changed through like over the air stuff, some of the application, but to, to change our whole model, it's even more complicated. So how do we do this? So there's some core challenges to that. So like uh, communications are expensive, ah, but they have more batteries <laughs> better. And yes, but if you ask a gamer, if you, he wants a cable or, a wireless device, you still use the cable. You have scheduling issues because those scheduling issues are common on computers still. And imagine when you have like those uh, IoT operation, operating systems are relatively really <coughs> new. We have limited memory bandwidth and I probably said that now you have megabytes of RAM. Yes, I said they have megabytes of RAM, but have you tried to run a neural network on 16 meg of RAM? or 16K, and at the same time, I'm collecting data that I'm not sure of what this data are, is, are, will be. So how can I assign this data to a given application? I'm collecting temperatures data. It goes to a fire detection application, uh, air condition application. How can I give the meaning to this data? Hardware is extremely heterogeneous. If you talk about the IoT on the internet nowadays, our talk is Arduino stuff. And you see a lot of people playing with Arduinos and Hasper Pies. And all of a sudden, it's... no, 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 this, this is like cheap IoT. Yeah? You see that more complicated stuff. You have more like STM devices, Nordic devices, you have Manscaped devices, and all those devices have totally different ARM architectures and different operational systems. Compiles things for those stuff. It's completely different how you, they exchange messages and they mean the same thing. And there's a very interesting thing that you should have learned in physics about calibration. Our temperature sensors that come from a MANSIC device, it's the same from an Arduino device. They collect the same thing. They mean the same thing. If not, how bad is this? It's complicated. And your energy efficiency on training those neural networks is statistical heterogeneity. And if you start training something on the sensor, a better sensor is faster than the uh, worst one. So I have stragglers, people that will be left behind. How can I do that and solve those things? And then actually my first work on this means about quantization, one of the prizes is about the words that we do at quantization, like you collect data and data uh, 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 
generates a histogram of data. So as you collect, you see that there, there are peaks about your data. So can I represent a great amount of data as statistical uh, variables, such as the average, the mean, the variation, the variance, contosis, symmetry. So can I represent this mass of data instead of storing in my sensor, represented by four or five elements? And the, and the, the, the real, the great answer of uh, this work, this is a master teaser is no economics. No, come on, you, you did a master teaser that your answer is no, but it's a complex no. It's not an easy no, it's a kind of no. It's, it's a no, but if you could take some measures, this is a useful no. And most like, uh, as you say in the statistics, models are not, Perfect, they are useful. What I'm trying to get is useful notions. Can I generate synthetic data through those measurements in order to give weight to my decision systems, either a Bayesian decision system or a neural network output, given that this data is not everything that I got? Like, what I've been trying to do is to make a function that represents the data that I collect. So, like, when you imagine that you are trying to rent an apartment in Rio, what is, is your feeling about rent in Rio nowadays? It's cheap. It's expensive. But you can't know if, if, if I tell you, say to you all, if I have a, a, an apartment on Gardia by 1500 reais, it, is it a deal? Or is this something that's Expensive, cheap or expensive? Well, which is a five fifteen fifteen hundred guys. That's cheap. Uh, uh, depends if, if the part is this. So I can <laughs> try to have this feeling that uh, is either true or not. So I change what I get. Imagine that my what we're trying to say is if I get this is this is from Instagram. I can't say temperature is like sixty five degrees. But what, what I can try to infer is there is a fire. So I change the part more what I'm trying to looking for. I change the level of the information and try to cut the edges to get that this information. This is the result it was very, very, very powerful and gave us a lot of interesting uh, devices. And so, and then I started to look some two guys that were very, very not represented, uh, the asymmetry and kurtosis. Usually when you go to like statistics statistic 101, you get like uh, average, means, variance, uh, and that's most it and some Gaussian stuff and hypothesis tests, and that's all there is. But and you, when you see Gaussian, why you try to turn to Gaussian curves? Because they try to summarize data. That's all about it. It's about summarizing data, but data is not symmetric. We wish our data were symmetric. But if I can represent asymmetric data by sums of Gaussians, and what I'm trying to do is, in this sense, when I quantize to form sums of Gaussians that will represent better my data. And then if I distribute my decisions, I can share this decision among my sensor, but sharing just bytes instead of loads of uh, sensor measurements. And this, the results was quite powerful and gave to the sensor their match to give the detections. And this is still a working on in progress that I'm working for the last five or six years. And uh, what I have to tell you, you guys are watching on YouTube and you're here is like worth research takes time. Research that's actually useful takes a lot of time and trial and error, more errors than everything else. But I keep making mistakes, and this is fun. That is for me. So, and by those, the, uh, we get to what we call knowledge fusion. Actually, knowledge fusion is a term that was coined by a researcher in Google called Shin Luna Dong. Now, she's awesome researcher. She, she came from uh, she's from Google, then she went to Amazon. From Amazon, she is now on Meta. And nowadays, I, I stopped following her, but she's still Meta. And the idea is. If I get his heterogeneity, 
I have a middleware, a common sense of understanding that you can extract or do this transformation to go up, reduce my uncertainty, and then I can interpret. So knowledge fusion is the sum of internet things, knowledge management, and multiple application wireless sensor networks. But I try to get this information to create knowledge about the situation. And we have used this and published several papers around this, this topic to do this inside of sensors, actions, alert as you want. So we're trying to reduce and use it and like complicated environments such as smart grids. And then what we're trying to do was a biasing approach of reinforcement learning, where I got this sensor and try to see if I get this new data, this will, it will change the environment that I have left. So instead of getting a, a huge amount of data stored on my sensor, I have like a state amount of uh, collect data, like I collected 30 uh, data before, and I'm, am I close to changing my state if I get something else? So this do is vital for resource limited approaches, not perfect, but pretty good. And it was able to map and access situations using our coexisting applications. So inside a very small sensor, I could try to gather the states of different applications. If, of course, if the application is too complex, if the source code is too big, won't be able to put on the sensor. There's no magic about it. So you have 8K, you have to be good 8K. If you want to do things like uh, huge uh, Go applications inside of a sensor, good luck. I'm still using C. <laughs> so the idea is that I can map those states, uh, those sensors as a graph and the, the E uh, set of communication links. Then I'll try to consume applications and I will imagine my knowledge as, as action, action in fact. What is this? The state I am, the state I'm trying to go and what is happening right now. So fact is a cost for choosing an action. So what I imagine is, applied to a group of decision systems or probabilities such, such as by agent. And what you are able to try to get this result, it recall resulting in Athena. Athena was one of those algorithms that are using a math filter and common sense, a big old fashioned average. Average is okay. Right? Average is a four, conditional jump, and that's it. So to try to learn what the idea is, I have a new cost of something and the new cost is a transitional state. I, have, I want to be in a desirable condition. For instance, what is a desirable condition? There is no fire. Being fired, bad thing, no, no fire, good thing. That's all. So I try a very traditional by and stuff to try to uh, uh, updates. If the outcome is positive of my collection data, I don't change the environment. If otherwise, I change. So it's a very Bayesian update procedure that you get me to this. Now, a sum of probabilities, and this is action and if at the end, if the cost is higher than what I had, uh, had before, or probably uh, my, I can change my state. So it's just a hypothesis test. I get all the sum represented by a number, updates every time that I get a new sensor. Instead of having all this data, I just record the state. So we have really good results with really low resource consumption. And we had like close results into several states. And you can see in this paper, though some states are complicated. And even in the worst case, we get better than a coin. So it's very good. We try to. Uh, increase values like the cost battery is uh, we are using a smart grid environment. We have a battery and OVPR overhead power line. And we are measuring a battery in a overhead power line with the same set of sensors. And we had like really, really good results with it. And that was not good enough because now I started to see that even my sensors, as time passes, they deteriorate. So I'm not un uncertain about my environment but about my measurement condition. So we start to apply subjective logic. There's a field of logic. And the main researcher that I find is Professor Aldo Yosun from the Oslo University that has this, the same thing. Every time that I collect data, I have four possible states, belief, disbelief, uncertainty, and negation. 
So I collect data about something. I may believe that this data represents something. I have a certain degree of disbelief. And to, for you to see uh, a very simple example, like is cloud tall? Kind of. So there's some level of belief that I'm tall, some level of disbelief, which is not, not tall at all, some level of kind of, and some level that I'm not using glasses. That's the thing. I'm not using glasses. That's the thing. And that's what we use to build like trust networks. Do can I trust this sensor? Not only I can trust if someone has is sitting this sensor, but I can I trust what he's measuring it. So I can use this probability to change states because to change states when I'm talking about like watering a plant is okay, but when you have like a hard device, it's not okay. So the results were quite good. Leaving us to actually go into cloud services sometimes to get better decision, but it's okay. So the idea is to receive data, identify an anomaly and cut it off. Generate your opinion, compress everything that was not anomalous using the Athena device and then calculating and sending opinions. And that led us to really nice stuff that I've been doing around the years. This is Nautilus. This is my summary. Yes, the build summaries, they are great. Here's my autonomous vehicle. We've been competing the RoboSub competition for the last few years. In 2021, we were the seventh in the world with a $10,000 uh, budget. Not very much. And this is a robotical farm in cooperation with the Autonomous University of Bucaramanga in Colombia. So thank you people from UNAD. And this is the thesis of Alejandra. Alejandra was my master's student with cooperation professor Jesus Talavera. He is now not on the university anymore, he's in the industry. But as you can see, this is a very traditional Arduino system inside using pipes, very cheap pipes, and a solar power when you collect data from the from the uh, farms themselves. And you will learn something when you do go to the field. So another consideration for someone that go to the field, do things outside, labs are great, they should be more labs, but the world outside, it takes some uh, extreme measurements. For you to see, this sensor is a pool sensor because the water resistant sensors was not, were not water resistant. So pool <laughs> sensors were. So it's uh, uh, knowledge from the field. And this is Waika, Y from Ifra from Minas, no? Why? <laughs> it's uh, IoT. A uh, device to analyze milk quality on real time. So you put milk from a cow, you can sense if there is like diseases or the cow has like some hormones or things like, like this. It's not proper for the milk distribution. You, you can do this on a level, a sensor level at your cup and an edge level on your cell phone and a cloud level and you have better analysis. Here is a very simple interface. It's a LED, had no milk, green, yes, milk. So, and here a little bit more information that you can do. And we won a prize at the Vacaton, and it's a cow town. That is the best name for a Vacaton ever. So it uh, was a Vacaton from Embrapa, Gadi Leite, né? cow and milk, and uh, here in Brazil. And we won against uh, another 20 or 30. Uh, other universities was great. And people from Rio winning things from cow and cattle is interesting, but it shows that everything is modeling. So conclusion, because I have to cut it out in 45 minutes, things have their place on the internet. So we have, they have industry 4.0 is a reality, industry 5.0 is a, is a desire. Better monitoring means better data and better data means better decisions. But better decisions mean better policies. We are getting data to enhance people's lives. Our technology is not based on made for people. It's not useless, it's cruel, but it's even worse. We cannot do this uh, for ourselves. There's groups of people, this thing of the magician, although I have this beard of magician, crazy guy from cats, this does not mean that I'm alone. I have a lot of people working on my lab and trying to do stuff and people that build stuff then may or may not be with us for a long time, but people are the only ones responsible for us to be able to be doing, 
doing nice research and giving results to society. So on other, if you have, don't have a team, you don't have enough to do great things. So, and this, this leads us to marketing time. And we're bringing for the first time, things what I do is data fusions to reduce uncertainty. I'm trying to bring those things to Latin America. There are not many groups working with data fusion and decision side of sensors in Latin America. So we are building La Fusion. That's my name, it's a great name, La Fusion. So Latin America Workshop Information Fusion, the first in Latin America will be this year in November 25, uh, in Rio at my university at Copy at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. More details soon will be on your SBC list. So you have to be on SBC, uh, Brazilian Computer Society. That is great. This is a workshop. Two days in trying to bring a good camp to this workshop. More information soon. And uh, if you're able to go there and try to publish a paper in this, this is a preparation for this conference, the information fusion that will be next year on Venice. So you can start a small paper, go to our workshop in Rio, have a review from the people that will be on this conference and prepare your paper to send to here. And if you are on Paris crazy run, it's an A2 conference if you like it. But if you don't care, the food is great and we are there. But if you are really interested in the things I'm saying, there will be another LA fusion on, uh, in 2024 to prepare you for the main goal. This is fusion at Rio. The first time that fusion will be on Latin America will be in Rio 2025. And I hope to survive. <laughs> to this mess, but it will be great. So I'm trying to, to create this community in Latin America. So we visit several universities in the last, in the last few months to, to, to reach the world of fusion. But uh, it's, uh, uh, it's all about reducing the strategy and enhancing decision. So this, uh, the symbol is LAPA because it represents what I've been trying to bring for good or worse. So it's, uh, hope you enjoy it. And people trying to call me and during the meeting, but how cool is Telegram? So guys, this is it. Sorry to take you that long and thank you for your attention. There are some questionings on the chat. So thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk uh, about uh, 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 data fusion and, and sensor fusion. And uh, I don't know if, if uh, the remote people have also some questions. Solenier has us here also. Thank you, Solenier. Thank I'm you. opening now for people here to see them. You can ask questions, uh, send money, anything that you want. <laughs> I think no questions You're from the local audience. A remote audience. And if you don't want to ask, if you are shy, don't want to talk to me right now, you have my email in here uh, at class. Mm -hmm. This is my email. Feel free to ask questions. I'll do my best to answer all of them. It's just too complicated. Thank you so many for your uh, yeah. nice comments. Okay. Thank you a lot. And questions, uh, well, things I that want, want to comment, I, 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 share your feelings. You can, your please. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned the uh, uh, the trust uh, network. Yes, does it mean that uh, is it made of sensors which are uh, closer together but distributed, or is it a conceptual level of uh, no it's actual sensors that they're distributed and try to exchange data with themselves in a distributed environment yeah. of course most traditional uh, uh, security approaches are uh, centralized this makes a lot of sense but sometimes you just don't have this option yeah so we're trying to like if you take from distributed systems approach and try to Byzantine algorithms exactly. so yeah. it's Byzantine, yeah. Yeah, Byzantine algorithms they are awesome we are using them blockchain stuff but they are just too complicated for sensors so we have to try something different and it's as and what I'd like about sensors networks and internet of things and I usually from uh, resource constrained decision systems is you uh, you start from the point saying maybe I'm wrong and this is awesome because you know that's usually you are taught in, in universities 
I'll do this perfect system that will be perfect and my accuracy will be on 100%. And real life, let's sorry for this shit happens. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's just too complicated for the real world to do this. So the idea is I don't actually trust my measurements, but I'll get them and see if they are useful, if the things that I'm seeing. So it's like when you are gossiping, imagine that you shouldn't do that, but it's, uh, uh, it's ugly stuff. But if you're talking about someone, someone says, mm, this, this guy is, is cool. This guy is not cool. And you, you join this with your own perception of the world. You say, okay, makes sense. I saw this guy, he seems cool. Or I have no idea. And I received this guy is cool. I can try to, to get this information and try to summarize. So if I have no perception, uh, perception, every perception is okay for me. So what I'm trying to do with this type of network is to get like, okay, I have no perception someone says it's cool. Is it enough for me to form an opinion? No, I'll wait some more. A second, a, second, a second action comes. This guy is cool. Instead of having to this guy is cool, what I have is I don't change my state. So in this way, I can summarize and yet have a high level decision. So uh, this is a way to try to form. It's kind of using the Byzantine algorithms, but cheating. And it's fun. It's a lot of time, not a long time, the, the idea of the religions. So we, we don't put only one guy to, to, to measure something. We put a group of They try to see what happens. With, with uh, majority or yeah, so like this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the local majority, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then you bring the problem of local process. Yeah. 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 To decide yeah. The, yeah. which is the best information. Yeah. Another question is uh, regarding the learning in, in, yeah. the, in this sense. As I understood, you, you are trying to learn what is the context where things are happening and where the measurement. Mm -hmm. But what happens if the context changes very fast? You so, commit mistakes. Huh? You commit mistakes. Yeah, and then but, you but, learn. But, 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 but what if the nature of the application is of very fast change, like in mobile centers? Yeah, the, this is a very interesting stuff because, like, the requirements of what your context says how fast you can change. So, if you are like in a vehicular network where things are about to change too fast, this is okay. So, you have to say, like, I cannot keep my states too tight. Like for instance, in the house, we expect things in the house, instead, unless you are Harry Potter, your house will not change place. So it's, these are very tight <laughs> space. But if a same point, like, yeah, <laughs> usually, it's, it's an earthquake, it changes the fast. So it's another type of problem. And uh, if you, and, but in the vehicular network, you say that the, this not, uh, not stay in your state, is your context. Mm. So you start to see like changing, it's okay. So we have to map this. This is a very interesting work that we are doing at the University of Ottawa due to a uh, former student of Mike Christoffel. Hey Christoffel, hope you're seeing us on YouTube. Like, subscribe, <laughs> you know guys? So it's a, this history, this tribe type of works like, imagine that you are in Canada and you are in a fast train. So in a region like Ontario and that's really cold and you go like to Vancouver that's not so cold. So that your like body sensor, you change this. If you don't have enough time to decide stuff or to keep the state, you have to, you have to, uh, a bad result. So uh, and in some cases, the decision cannot be on the device. You have to take to an edge level then to a cloud level and to assume that like, okay, it's better to have some uh, a decision at this level that is incorrect that I can change that I have no decision at all. And being correct, it's okay. Given, a, of course, heart diseases, there's, you have to have like a comma, a zero ground from here, don't go. So, but uh, you have to accept that in some decision you will Make mistakes. So design this uh, yeah. process. Yeah, I can understand. If, if yeah. you, if you are very fast, you have to answer quickly. If you cannot uh, say to, to the cloud, then you see wait for the answer. Then you have to yeah. decide on sensor. And yeah, if, if that's it. If your edges 
they, they change. Go, they go with the sensors. It's more reasonable that you have maybe the the the, the aggregation of context information yeah, at in, the edge. At the, uh, in at the form, edge, it's okay. In a mobile device, in a very fast mobile device, you have to take a lot of inside of the sensor. And then make sense for you to do have like reinforcement learning inside of the sensor. Because since it changes, you have to have your own perception of your environment. Mm -hmm. And you can't go to the cloud that often. Uh, or there's, there was this trend some years ago about like, it's very common on the Brazilian symbol of computer networks, about like uh, a drones inside of farms collecting data from the sensors. And imagine that the drone pass and send data to the sensor, and it's okay. And then someone, after seeing the drone passes, start to place a fire inside of the farm. You can't decide, you can't wait for the, 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 the edge to take a decision. You have to sound an alarm. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the, what is the, what I like to say is, what is your worst case scenario? For in the, in the, and this is very important in the case of the submarine. For me, the worst case scenario is the, the cask to break. And this is, yeah. yeah. So because the cask break, there's game over. There's, there's nothing more. As we saw now. In the, yeah. In the, in the, in the That's why I don't use uh, submarines with metal. I use polymers. <laughs> Everyone knows that. Except not everyone apparently, but yeah, yeah. okay. So uh, I, I've never heard about the you said the uh, subject logic. Yes, it's a Does new. Does it have so. some relation to the logic? Yes, that? like it have the Dietrich distribution. It's a tri-dimensional distribution. Right. So in this sense, we're trying to map in this in this. Uh, Tri-dimensional shape. The the imagine that's a higher level fuzzy fuzz logic that you are not seeing a, like a, a plane anymore, but like a, like in a sphere, a surface, okay. and you try to map in this. This is the the base idea, uh -huh. and then you can try to say like, okay, this is the uh, fuzzy logic I have uh, uncertainty around my uh, my data, but now I have not so uncertainty around my data, but around the the device that is collecting the data itself. But if I have enough points from enough sensors, I can cut them off and map them on the, on this yeah. on this surface. And once more, this is not no way that I have to say to my students. You see, probability is important, calculus is important. This is you no, know, if this is a Gaussian, uh, a Gauss Gauss theorem, it's just this, and based on this probability thing, and how to implement those stuff is also. Interesting to see, like, how oh, you can implement this with the things you've learned. And to see that you can do a lot of things with basic stuff, like uh, statistics 101, um, calculus one, two, and three, and then um, basic coding, basic what you do in sensors, the thing that you learn in, the, in programming 101. So it's, it's, you just have to start to tinker in stuff and try to place it together and burn the stuff, burn your fingers with the soldering the devices and you see those things start to measure and you do it with not so much of knowledge you can be useful and that's the thing that's the most interesting thing that i've seen in iot is that with not so much you can be very useful to people and of course it's, if you go like to tracking and you start to have like jacobians and trans transforms okay the math starts to get complicated but and this this uh to begin with, there's a lot of stuff, but you start, and then you start to can uh, add up machine learning with tracking with this, and, and then your math, and but now you have the grounds, and it's fun. It's fun. This the professor actually from the, the subject logics, Aldo Miosum, and his website, he has his book, Subjective, Subjective Logic. He has a, a actually just half of the book, the other half is uh, is being sold by Eusebia. I don't know, I don't remember. But in his website, this, and he has these very interesting tools teaching subjective logic. And uh, I learned a lot, and he's a very cool guy. Actually, he'll be in Fusion 2025. He's my tutorial chat. Uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. So it's marketing. <laughs> so it's a really cool guy to talk with. And Vladimir, thank you, Vladimir. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, cool. Okay, so. Anything more? They would uh, like to to uh,
Well, hope you have enjoyed. Hope you have you yeah. forgive me for my lame jokes. No, no, but it's my email is here. Chad, any and, and I will well, talk to to Adriana. I think here uh, uh, there are some some uh, nice projects that we can uh, start. Maybe we, we uh, I mean we at, at the lack to more the software part, the middleware part, like the architecture maybe that you showed, mm -hmm. but uh, the gist has more lower level of energy and uh, with, with sensors, maybe a machine learning. I think that they, they could be very nice uh, interactions too. My pleasure. And we are neighbors, so it's easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you're welcome here at, at Book Rio every time you want to come here to just to, yeah. Have uh, coffee. Have coffee to chat. I'm seeing all your coffee, guys. All <laughs> your coffee. Então, muito obrigado. Tá? Obrigado, é. Max. Um prazer, gente. Muito obrigado, muito pessoal. Legal. Pessoal que está aí em casa, obrigado aí. Né? Obrigado aí pelos comentários, quem assistiu até o final. E a gente se vê por aí.